Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. My name is Andrea Judici and I am your host. I have with me my guide dog, who I'm choosing not to introduce for his focus and our safety. My topic tonight is responsible dog ownership when around a working dog. This is a topic that is very, very important to me. I am currently partnered with my sixth guide dog. And in the 29 years that I've been working guide dogs, he is the only one of my six that has not been attacked by a loose or under, out of control dog. And when I say attacked, I wanna to explain to you just how terrifying that experience is. One of my guide dogs, in fact, was so traumatized by that episode that he had to retire. When working a guide dog, I'm constantly out and about in the public. I'm, I'm, on sidewalks, in neighborhoods, I'm, I'm at businesses, I'm at the reservoir walking, and everywhere that I go, I encounter dogs. And some of them are on leash, and some of them are loose, some of them are very well-mannered, and some of them are totally out of control. And from my perspective, as the person working the guide dog, all I know is that something very scary is happening. There's a dog that's interacting with my dog, potentially in a very inappropriate manner, I don't understand if that dog has a person attached to it. I don't understand, I can't read its body language. I just know that, my, that I am under attack, my guide dog is under attack and I'm not safe. And it's so terrifying. And I try to explain to people when they get dogs as pets, how important it is that their dog be well-mannered and, and under control. But as I said in the beginning, of my six guide dogs, five have experienced an attack by a dog that was out of control and one of them had to retire because of that attack. I think that as a guide dog user, there is nothing more concerning to me. When I'm out and about in the public, it's not the people who aren't looking when they drive their cars because my dog can look for that. It's the fact that not only is this situation really terrifying for me, but think of it from my guide dog's perspective. His job is to protect me from the obstacles in the world that are out there. Now, if he's under attack, he is not necessarily going to defend himself because he feels he needs to be with me. He's not necessarily going to leave my side because he feels he needs to be with me. And so he's very vulnerable both physically and emotionally. My guest tonight, I've brought to this show because she's very knowledgeable. She's a guide dog, she's a former guide dog trainer. She has her own training business. She knows this both as a pet owner and as a person who's worked with working dogs. I'm so excited to have you here, Laura, and I wanna thank you for coming in. And before we get to any of my questions or topics, just tell me a little bit about you and the company that you currently run. Sure, yeah, um, I, I actually, I worked um, at a guide dog school for about five years, um, four years before I started my company. Um, I, my father has a guide dog, so I had gotten into volunteering there. I ended up working there for five years. Um, training and placing guide dogs all over the country. So I, I know that aspect, the training part, and working with a ton of clients, working in high dog density areas. Um, and then with my personal company, um, Leader Dog Training, LEDR Dog Training, um, I now work on the flip side. I work with the dog reactive owners, the owners that are having a hard time controlling their dogs. So I know it from both ends and, and the frustration that, you know, a pet owner can have and then the, the real, uh, you know, 
problems and issues that can arise when a dog does get attacked or feels uncomfortable in a situation, you know, when they're working. So I know both ends of, of the spectrum. So. Fabulous. I, you just brought up a really good point, which is when I say, when I use the word attacked, people envision this vicious physical attack where there's lots of blood and fur and while well, that does happen, the majority of certainly the encounters that my guide dogs have had and, the, and my friend's guide dogs have had seem perhaps on the surface to not be problematic at all. Mm -hmm. There's not been a lot of snarling. The dog, the guide dog is able to work when the episode is over. Um, and so it may not appear immediately that there's a problem. And yet I can, I can speak personally to the incident that retired my guide dog was very quick. It took maybe 10 seconds. I believe it was a neighbor's dog, although the person didn't speak up and tell me who they were. Um, and I thought my dog was fine. He didn't ever growl. He wasn't physically hurt. We went off, we did our thing. And within a month, he wasn't working. Mm -hmm. um, the, the incident that has happened most recently with my last guide dog, I encountered a dog that was tethered outside of a store. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the dog was there. My guide dog, we were walking along the, the, the strip mall. My guide dog wasn't giving me any indication that there was a dog ahead of us because he was ignoring the dog, which was as he was trained to do. The dog we were approaching gave no indication it was there. It didn't bark or growl or cry or anything until we were within its leash range. Mm. And then it jumped my dog and I was so shocked. And um, there was no one there to talk to because I don't know where that owner was, but they weren't mm. with their dog. Again, that situation happened really quickly. I was able to pull my dog back and, and get out of that pet dog's leash range. And mm -hmm. so that stopped the problem. But Every guide dog user that I talk to, all of my friends, my, my brother who's a guide dog user, talk about the fear that they have when they encounter dogs and the increase of loose dogs and, and non-controlled dogs. Yeah. And so I'm very much hoping that in our discussion tonight, we can really get across the importance of, I, I want everyone to have a pet dog if they want it. And I think every dog should be allowed to walk around in the public areas um, the, the neighborhoods and the reservoirs and the parks, that's fabulous. But I, I beg for my watchers to understand the impact that their dog can have on mine. So I wanted to ask you for some hints. One of the things that happens to me a lot is dogs that are on long leashes or retractable leashes. Mm. So the dog is a fair distance from its person and that is a problem. But the other problem is that a lot of people seem to think that, that it's, it's good or okay for all dogs to meet each other when they're out and about in the public. Yeah, the my dog's friendly syndrome. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, may or may not have friendly dogs or think their dog is friendly, um, and they'll let their dog run up to another dog. But just because your dog is friendly doesn't mean that other dog that they're running up to is friendly. Now, in the case of a guide dog, that's never appropriate. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, people think, oh, my dog's friendly, my dog's friendly, they should meet. A lot of the times those meetings are head on, and dogs don't, uh, if they're friendly, do not meet head on. They actually meet by making a C with their body, sniffing each other's butt, showing each other that physically they're friendly. Um, so you've got two dogs running up to each other head on and that in itself can can create a problem or an attack um, just because of the tension and, then, and that visual tension between the dogs. Um, so it's really important that dog owners understand that even if your dog is really friendly, you've got this great dog, he'd love to meet other dogs, it's so important just with a pet dog situation to say, hey, my dog's friendly, can they meet? And then ask the owner if that's okay before you're dragged behind your dog up to meet another dog. Now in the case of, of a guide dog, it's never appropriate for your dog to meet another guide dog because that take, puts a lot of stress on the guide dog. It interferes with their work and now they're not able to, to really you know, protect their handler and do their job. Um, and how difficult would it be if, if you know, your dog's trying to work, a dog comes straight in his face, now you're anxious and that also makes the dog anxious. So all of that fear goes down the leash and the dog thinks, oh my mom's upset, something is happening I should maybe protect her and maybe that doesn't happen as much with Labradors but I worked a ton with German Shepherds and that definitely can be an issue is that you know hey I got to handle this situation and that in itself can knock a dog out of working condition and that's uh, you you bring up a really good point because when my first dog was attacked it was a it was a thing oh it happened okay we got over it mm -hmm. then the second dog mm -hmm. then the third dog well by the time the third and the third dog was the one that was retired by the time that happened I freeze up and panic if mm -hmm. I hear a dog anywhere near me well, this dog has no reason to think that a loose dog is something to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. But if I telegraph that to him, 
then it can make all him he knows is that I'm afraid, and so this yeah. situation is frightening. Yeah. And um, it's really it's really hard for me not to telegraph that fear. Yeah. And I know that so often I'll say to someone, you know, is that a dog? Is your dog on leash? And um, that at least helps me to establish whether they are a dog mm -hmm. and whether they are. But another place that I have a problem is, let's say there's something where dogs are technically allowed. Let's use an example of an outdoor fair mm -hmm. where, you know, it's, it's in the town. Maybe, maybe Celebrate West Hartford is a really mm -hmm. good example. Mm -hmm. Dogs are technically allowed there. But people are totally not focused on their dogs. They're mm. looking at they're looking at the beautiful crafts. Mm -hmm. They're talking to friends. They're and so I'm trying to work my dog in that environment. Very mm -hmm. tight quarters, mm -hmm. um, tables, and and you know booths. And um, how can how can I encourage my friends who have pets, pet dogs, mm -hmm. to realize that when they're out and about with their dog, you never know when a guide dog is going to show up in your sphere. Yeah. And to be, that it's not, a dog isn't a bracelet on your arm. A dog is a, <laughs> is a living responsibility that you have with you. What, how can I help people to understand that? I always tell my clients that if you're not able to focus 99% of your attention on your dog when you're out with them in public and in a very tight space with other people, they shouldn't be there. You know, if you're not able to, to notice when your dog is starting to react to something, get up because they see a guide dog, you know, any of that, or you don't have the control to be able to ask your dog to lay calmly while a guide dog is run, walking by, they shouldn't be going to fairs or, you know, public places where there's going to be a ton of dogs. Take your dog out to some, like to the woods, some place where you can create distance between your dog and the other dog. Because that's that's really what dog owners should be doing is create distance between the working dog and their dog. Um, what happens a lot is dogs get reactive about other dogs and people will correct them for reacting. But what happens then is that the dog now associates, okay, I see this thing, I'm already nervous about it because that's why I'm reacting. I'm fearful of what's happening. I don't have enough distance and I feel like I have to protect myself. Now the owner is jerking on their neck saying, hey, don't do that, hey, don't do that. Now the dog starts to realize, oh, when I see that thing I'm afraid of, now I'm getting corrected and I'm feeling pain. So I should be even more reactive to that thing that I'm afraid of. So instead of you know, correcting your dog for their behavior, what you wanna do is create distance so that your dog can become more comfortable. Um, you know, If your dog is lighting up, it's, it's already beyond threshold. It's, you can't train a dog when they're lighting up. You need to create distance so that they do, they're able to focus on you and, and then reward them for good behavior. Um, and that's a, that's a real challenge, uh, you know, old school versus new school training. You know, you, you need to create distance and make your dog feel comfortable in a situation. Because when your dog is reacting, you've, you've passed the threshold. They're uncomfortable and, and no amount of correcting them is going to make them feel better about where they are. Mm -hmm. so, so definitely with pet dogs, Create distance. If you see a guide dog out working, I, if you don't have enough control to be able to just tell your dog to lay there calmly, then you need to move out of the way. You know, that's really important. And that goes for guide dogs and it goes for other dogs too. You know, if you, if you don't have the control to be able to, you know, ask your dog to lay there calmly while another dog passes, then create distance so that you don't have any problems because you don't know what that other dog, you know, what its issues are, if it's working on something, if it's uncomfortable around other dogs. You want to just give it the benefit of the doubt, move away. When you are training dogs, both in their preparation to be an active guide mm -hmm. and in your placements, mm -hmm. tell me about some of the situations that, <laughs> as you're seeing, you're, you're behind yeah, the person placing person. the dog yeah. and you're seeing something unfold, yeah. I'm sure you're thinking, if I could just jump in and fix this. So tell me about yeah. some of those incidents where you really saw something and went, oh, if I, only we could step back and fix that. Yeah. Um, I, I had this one training situation. I actually wasn't training a client. I was training my own, you know, working dog at the time. Uh, and and we had a little dog tied with a retractable leash to a building able to go across the entire sidewalk. So imagine the retractable leash, probably the worst invention ever um, as far as safety wise, because I don't know if you know, you know a ton about retractable leashes, but the, the thing that I hate about them is once your dog's out, there's no getting them back in. You're gonna burn your hands, they can get tangled up, they're super unsafe, and they really shouldn't be used in public spaces where you don't have any control over your dog. Not to mention as a pet dog trainer, you you are teaching your dog that pulling is how they get what they want because the only way to make a retractable leash go out is if you pull. So you're teaching your dog to pull. Um, so this little dog is, is tied up on the retractable leash. I don't even know how someone does that. And it's gone across the sidewalk and I'm working my, my dog and uh, 
thank goodness this this dog was just brilliant. He he went right around the the little tiny leash, right around the dog, treated the whole thing as an obstacle. <laughs> but I could imagine a time when he doesn't even see that tiny skinny retractable line, walks right into it, everybody gets tangled up, and that would be a serious safety concern, you know. And, and that's that's one of the situations that come to mind right away when when you're working dogs. And so a dog left alone, a dog on a retractable leash, barking its little head off, and you know and if I, w if I wasn't sighted at the time, if I was doing like a blindfold or something like that, how scary would that be? You know, I, I could, I totally know where you're coming from on that, you know, and the dog that you mentioned that was tied out, um, you yes. know, you, how do you know that you're not getting tangled up in their leash? Besides the fact that I would never leave my dog tied somewhere where other people could possibly feed it something that it shouldn't, and I have no, you know, that's, that's for my own pet dog. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I know that it's very common, I think, is my experience that it's very common for dogs to get left out. Yeah. And they might be perfectly friendly dogs, or mm -hmm. they might not be. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel, I feel frustrated as a guide dog handler that I have to deal with that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that that's a, a, a and, and, and that it could potentially be a safety hazard, not not just for me by tripping over the leash, but for my dog's ability to, to be able to walk by that dog safely. Right, and that's, you know, I, I imagine how your dog became, you know, had a problem with, with other dogs is now they see this situation, the situation went badly before, now further and further down the road, they're already getting amped up, they're already getting exactly. anxious, they're feeling concerned, like, and each time that it happens, it takes less, you know, it, they're further away and getting more anxious, you know, the more. You right, know, and, and, I, and I certainly, all dogs, I'm not saying that guide dogs are the only intelligent dogs, but mm -hmm. guide dogs are so trained to anticipate, mm -hmm. to, to look ahead, along the sidewalk and go, okay, there's an obstacle. I need to move to the left or I need mm -hmm. to move to the right or there's going to be something that's too, that's, that's you know, going to bump my mom in the head. Mm -hmm. So if they're already trying to anticipate and they realize that they've had a negative experience with a dog, then they're going to see the dog and they don't even know what to, they just know mm -hmm. that that's an avoidance mm -hmm. situation. And so it's, it's very difficult. Um, and I, I'm so glad that you're here and willing to talk about this because I think that I don't want pet owners to think that their dogs are bad, and I don't want people to think that I think that pet, pet, pet dogs are bad. None of us in the guide dog using world feel that, but it's a constant fear to have a partner that you have spent significant time getting to be partnered with. And mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes six months to a year to really build that partnership. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and hundreds of thousands of hours have been spent to create the working dog. And in the blink of an eye, that dog is a extraordinarily expensive pet. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with having a pet, but a guide dog should never have to become a pet because someone else didn't have their dog under control. And I, I don't know how to impart that enough to people without sharing stories. I have friends whose dogs were brutalized wow. by other dogs. I mean, physically brutalized. Um, thankfully, in the instances of my guides, it was, it was an emotional impact, but the physically the dog was okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's very complicated and I just, um, I love the things that you're talking about because it helps people to understand how dogs interact. The, the comment you made about how the dog makes a C, like I know that, mm -hmm. but I couldn't, I didn't know the words to describe it. It's, <laughs> uh, it's exactly what they do. It's, yeah. it's, but to be able to describe that and um, I'm so glad you touched on the retractable leashes because so often, I, I walk at the reservoir quite a bit mm -hmm. and um, so often a dog will come sort of trundling along way far out from its person and they can't get it back or they again think it's perfectly okay for their dog to come up and be jumping all around my dog and mm -hmm. he's trying to guide me and um i think that understanding the impact mm -hmm. it has can be helpful another thing that's very frustrating and i'm not sure if you encountered this in your training of guide dogs but lots and lots of people are bringing their pets into public play, stores, mm -hmm. and the store may or may not have a sign that says no pets allowed, mm -hmm. but what I've been finding is that they're not well behaved. Mm -hmm. So they're barking at my dog or they're following my dog down the aisle, sniffing his butt, mm -hmm. and he's like, I'm trying to work here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not social time. Um, and so did you encounter that a lot were you, when you were out either training, training guides or placing them where there were 
you were in a grocery store or you were in a drug store or you were in or a, I was you in know, a bank and there was right. a loose dog yes. in the bank while yes. I'm trying to teach someone how to find a counter. Exactly. Yes, I, I encounter that quite a bit. Um, and, and I think that it's not, you know, people aren't being malicious about it. They're just so uninformed about how they need to behave and what they're, you know, the respect that their dogs need to have if they're going to bring them out into to public places. Um, and not even, you know, guide dogs, people don't understand that not everybody wants their pet dog jumping all over them, you know, whether or not there's a guide dog involved in it. And and it's not that people are being malicious, they're just uneducated, I think, about, you know, the the importance of the guide dog focusing on, on their work. Um, but yeah, I've encountered quite a few. Um, even with my pet dog, I, I do bring my pet dog into Home Depot and I bring some other dogs in to train. Um, and I had a dog following us. Now, luckily, you know, I, I could see that the dog is following us down the aisle. No, no owner. My dog's, you know, at heel walking nicely with me, but it's the same, you know, situation that these, you know, people are bringing their pets more places and good, you know, good for them. Bring your pet more places and train them more so that they're able to be more places with you exactly. uh, and be respectful of the other people that are there. Right, and yeah. I know that just talking with my friends who, who aren't necessarily dog people or even who like the dogs that they know mm -hmm. but aren't comfortable with just dogs in general, mm -hmm. they don't want to be approached by yeah. a dog without knowing that that dog is going to be okay. They yeah. don't want to be sitting, you know, at Home Depot and have a dog just run up to right. them. Right. Like, yeah. you know, that, that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, like, like, that's, like, that's, that's just not a comfortable thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, and that's and that's a definitely people are, are getting more access with their dogs to stores. And then I think that people have more of a responsibility to train their dogs so that they can behave appropriately in public. Um, and, and I think that people just don't know the level of training that's needed for their dog to be safe in public. A lot of people think that their dog, oh, my dog comes when he's called, you know, he's fine, but they're still animals that have their own brains and no dog is 100% on recall. They just aren't. Um, a lot of people will bring their dogs off leash in, in public places where there's a lot of dogs and, and you know, your dog may be trained the best in the world, but suddenly, you know, a squirrel puts, two, you know, runs two inches in front of its nose and your dog takes off and now it's a problem for everybody else. Um, so I think it's important for people to really get training on their dog. And then if you're having a struggle with your dog, because there's there's a lot of great people out there right now that are adopting dogs, but and a lot of Southern dogs, um, that dogs that need a lot of rehab, but they're not getting the help that they need necessarily from those, those places that they're getting the dogs. It's, you know, your responsibility as an owner to go Go out and get the help that you need and not feel bad about it. You know, not everybody's a dog trader and that's fine, but go out and get the help that you need so that, you know, your dog can be feel more comfortable in situations and that everybody else around you can feel more comfortable. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the things that I think sometimes gets lost is there's so much of what a guide dog learns that's about how to navigate, mm. how to, how, or how to, you know, how to pilot this team mm. through areas. But another huge piece of what a guide dogs get is how to be a good citizen. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, I mean, a guide dog doesn't even get to go into training if it doesn't know how to be a good citizen. Right. And people look at my dog and they think, oh, he's so good. Well, he's good because he was given wonderful foundation. Mm -hmm. He's good because he had great training. He's good because I'm consistent with what I ask of him. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, if you took the guide dog aspect out of him, if I was just out with him and he was just being a dog mm -hmm. without being a guide dog, there would be still a high level of behavior mm -hmm. that I would expect of him and that he would demonstrate right. because that's just part of being a good citizen. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like people are not quite on the same page with their pet dogs. That it, it's okay, and, and I know people who have small dogs. Well, it's okay because it's only a small dog. <laughs> small well, yes, dog it's, syndrome. <laughs> it's, it's better if you're going to get jumped on by a dog. This dog will come up to your head mm -hmm. and knock you over. A yeah. smaller dog might just, you know, hit your leg. And but yeah. it, but it's. I don't care if the dog weighs two pounds or five hundred pounds. I don't feel like it's ever appropriate for a dog to be jumpy. Yeah. To, to be like, yay! I'm so glad to see you and plant their paws. And I think sometimes people, I know. I don't think it. I absolutely know that people look and say, well, it's just a small dog. Yeah. So it's okay. It's okay if it's ill-mannered because it's so cute and it's the, the behavior that's perfectly cute in a 15-pound dog. If my dog did it, they would say he was crazy and out of control. I'm like, but, but why? Why is it? Because they're little. They get to get away with that. And that's, that's a frustration for me when I'm visiting people with my dog just mm. as a pet when he's not working, when yeah. he's off duty, not as a pet, when he's off duty and he's just being a dog. Yeah. Um, and people are like, well, my little dog is, it's okay because they're just little. And I'm mm -hmm. like, 
not so much. <laughs> I had the worst attack actually on um, one of my clients was by two little dogs that had escaped a yard. Yep. Um, and they actually made contact. We were actually out doing a, a cane walk and uh, the the dogs came up and, and bit her right in the ankle. And yeah. now, you know, she's she's got a wound from dogs that we don't know at all. We had to follow them, or I'm following them back to the house to find out if they've got their rabies shots because the dog is loose, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, the dog gets out all the time. <laughs> Well, you know, let's let's stop your tiny dog from attacking people. Um, so it's definitely a, a real problem. And, you know, how scary for that, that client who, you know, can't see that these dogs are coming up to her. I mean, how awful. Um, it's and- interesting. Two of the, the my second dog that was attacked was attacked by five or seven. I'm not sure because I couldn't tell. A little pack of little dogs. She was a 90 mm. pound German Shepherd. Mm. And this little pack of dogs came along and they were biting her tummy and her ankles and mm. her tail. I, I was trying to stomp on them. Yeah. <laughs> and I, co- I mean, I couldn't get them to go away. And there were so many. Yeah. And um, I think that there's a, a myth, of a, a sense that all dogs that attack are um, certain sort of dogs. Large that are, breed dogs. Large breed dogs. Yeah. That, and I used to, I lived in a town in California where there was a ridiculously grumpy, unpleasant golden retriever. He always was tied to a bicycle rack. You had to walk past him. His person was in the gym, and you had to pa- walk past him. I mean, golden retriever, seriously? Like, yeah, but some. But he like... was just—he was a grumpy pants, and he and I hated walking past there because I never knew if he was going to be there. And he'd come out, and I was always afraid he was going to get to us. Thankfully, he wasn't strong enough to move the whole bicycle rack. Mm-hmm. But he'd come charging out, growling and snout. And he was a golden retriever. And how stressful so... for you, and how stressful <laughs> for that dog that's left there to protect itself. Right, exactly. Tied to a bicycle rack. <laughs> exactly. And so, yes, obviously there are certain dogs that might be less likely, you're probably less likely to find golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers being uh, vicious. <laughs> I but, work with quite a few in the pet dog <laughs> world. But. but I think that that's important. That we don't want to just villainize certain breeds. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because his best friend is a pit bull. And yeah. she's the sweetest dog and they have the best time and, he, and she's his absolute best friend in the whole world and um you know it doesn't matter where the dog what the dog's breed is what matters yeah. is that it has been socialized that it has been given knowledge and experience and experiences so that it doesn't have to feel threatened and afraid um to that point, the body language. I mean, the body language is so important. People don't know how to read their dogs, and, and you'll, the dog will be in a very aggressive stance, and people won't understand that that's what their dog is doing. Oh, it, they're just playing. Yeah, and, and so I think it's it's great if you can educate yourself on um, body language with your dog so that you can be a more responsible owner and know more. See how your dog is communicating with you. Absolutely. Well, I'm so excited that you came, and I have a, a thousand more questions, so I might have to have you come back uh, and bring a dog. And show us all the cool stuff. What I, what I just want to reiterate before this show comes to an end is that as a guide dog user, I can say hands down, the thing that frightens me most is the under, the, the, the non-controlled, either off or on leash dogs that I encounter. And the fact that I'm on dog number six, and so far we're, we're just celebrating three years together. We've made it three years without a dog attack. And I count that as being some sort of miracle. And I'm so pleased that he's a, a well-adjusted dog and he's comfortable. But I want to, to just implore everyone to be responsible, to not assume that your dog is friendly and can in, interact with my dog. My dog is essentially, a guide dog is essentially a piece of medical equipment when he's working. And, and, and you wouldn't let your dog go up and take someone's wheelchair and run down the street with it, you would, you would say that that was inappropriate. Again, you've tuned in tonight to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View, and we've been talking with Laura, who is very experienced on multi-levels about dog training in general, training guide dogs specifically, and, and being very involved with a person who has a guide dog, um, your dad, so you know firsthand the, the frustrations and the fears that we face. And... I want to also tell you that there's a new, I've got a new email. Anyone who wants to direct a question or comment can email at a blind woman's view at gmail.com. Thank you again for being here tonight. Thank and you. tell me again your website. Uh, it's leaderdogtraining.com. So L E D R dogtraining.com. Laura, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you. all of you for watching and keep those dogs at your side. Yeah.